backing up a little bit, if this is the first time that you are joining us for a third Thursday, this series is meant to highlight the latest in research and practice for disaster management and disaster risk reduction. And we have a monthly third Thursday uh, to spotlight some of the work that our center is doing as well as what our partners are doing. Um, and so like Carl mentioned, today's topic is on cybersecurity. And our center doesn't necessarily consider this our soup du jour, but um, I will also add as commentary, uh, like Carl did, that we approach disaster management through a pretty unique perspective of planning. Um, so we recognize that uh, cities and developed areas are increasingly dependent on information systems to deliver public goods and to ensure public safety. And so best practices for preparedness, which is our bread and butter, um, whether against cyber attacks, climate change, or sudden onset hazards is crucial. Um, and so moving on to our speakers, what we're going to do in terms of format is start with individual presentations by all of our panelists. And then at the very end, we will hold a Q&A discussion. But we do encourage you to submit questions in the chat along the way so we can collect them and have them ready for our speakers at the end. Um, and feel free to ask your questions out loud as well uh, when we open it up for that session. And just so everyone knows, we will be recording today's session to make it available to everyone uh, who is not able to attend live. So without further ado, I want to introduce our very first speaker who is a dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Clara DeServo who is the director of the Providence Emergency Management Agency. She joined the Pima team in April 2018 as the deputy director after five years of working in the emergency management and response field as a consultant and EMT and cardiac firefighter. In April 2020, she became the director and was appointed as the lead for the capital city's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. She also holds a PhD in emergency and disaster management from the University of Rhode Island. Uh, so I will share Clara's slides. Give me one moment. And she's going to talk to us today about cybersecurity at the state and local level. Thank you so much, Lily, uh, for such a kind introduction. And I am honored to be invited to speak with you all today. Uh, as Lily said, I've been the director for the last two years here at Providence Emergency Management Agency. And in addition to doing the uh, COVID-19 pandemic response, as well as a series of other disasters, we've had an increasing focus on cybersecurity and cyber preparedness here at the local level. And I'm really excited to be able to share a few of the things that we've considered with you all today. Uh, next slide, please. So for many years, cybersecurity experts have been warning about the need for increased federal, state, and local emergency management preparedness for a potential cyber Pearl Harbor, which would be a cyber attack with widespread impacts, causing significant disruption to critical infrastructure and essential services at a local, regional, and or national level. Just to highlight a couple of the most recent incidences, Costa Rica right now is currently battling a widespread uh, cyber attack. And just the other, just yesterday, President Chavez stated that Costa Rica is at war with the Conti hackers who have infiltrated 27 government institutions and shut down wide swaths of government services. Israel also declared a state of emergency after the, their largest cyber attack in their history. And as we all, I am sure, remember in May 2021, just barely over one year ago, large swaths of the East Coast suffered significant critical infrastructure and essential service impacts after the Colonial Pipeline ransom attack, which was caused by a breach to a single leaked password. So these incidents are already here. They are already happening with alarming regularity and they have already started causing widespread impacts on critical infrastructure and essential services on the local, regional, and national level. Next slide, please. Our particular focus has been on the local vulnerability to cyber threats because there have been multiple small, medium, and large cities that have had significant impacts in the last few years. Atlanta was one of the first major attacks in 2018 
It ended up with the city paying 2.7 million for crisis communication and security agencies. And the total recovery costs ended up costing over $17 million. So Baltimore also similarly ended up paying over $6 million that they took out of their parks and public facilities to fund their cyber attack remediation. New Orleans is a really interesting case because while they did end up having to declare a state of emergency, they were uniquely prepared to respond to their network outage due to the pre-planning and preparedness systems that they have in place in preparation for their hurricane response. So getting back to a little of what Lily said, that having that all hazard preparedness really applies to cybersecurity as well. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I've encountered as I've tried to start having more conversations with colleagues uh, locally and nationally about the role of emergency management in cybersecurity has been that emergency managers are frequently, rarely, are not cyber experts. We're not IT experts. We don't have that high level of technical expertise needed to really be sufficient in the cybersecurity realm. But what we're really good at is putting the pieces back together. And our job for all hazards is to bring order and structure to chaos. We are supposed to put the Rubik's Cube back in the right order when an incident has happened and scrambled the Rubik's Cube. So what that means for us in a cybersecurity context is our job is to ensure that there's the foundational structure and the systems in place to support a cyber attack response and to ensure that essential services are still being provided, including communication, logistical and operational support for cyber response, and on the municipal level, ensuring that our constituents and residents are still getting the essential services that they require. When they need an ambulance or a fire apparatus, when they call 911, the systems are still in place for us to respond and provide essential services. Kids can still be in school, people can still pay their tax bill, and we as a municipality can still issue paychecks to our employees. Maintaining those essential services is our job, as well as providing that structure. For cybersecurity, an additional component is that we're responsible for managing continuity of operations and continuity of government planning and exercising for all hazard incidents. And we need to be including cybersecurity as an essential component of our all hazards response and planning. Next slide, please. Like any agency, uh, at the local level, we have a lot of challenges when we are trying to address um, a problem as vast and as sophisticated as cybersecurity. Most local governments, I don't know of any government that has adequate st staffing or sufficient budgeting. There are multiple competing issues that are demanding similar resources, and it is constantly a competition of who is going to get access to scarce resources. Additionally, in the emergency management realm, we are increasingly responding to multiple concurrent disasters at the same time. We're not just dealing with one incident, we're often dealing with cascading incidents. So whether it is responding to a hurricane or a blizzard on top of the COVID-19 pandemic response, or responding to a cyber incident that is concurrent with a natural hazards incident, we have multiple competing priorities on our time and on limited resources. An additional challenge that we have run into is that cybersecurity doesn't always have the same perceived risk levels as other hazards that have bigger, splashier impacts in the media and in popular perception. Uh, hazards like wildfires, hurricanes, and flooding end up with big pictures, big, they, they look big on TV. People have, can see the impacts of them in a more concrete manner than they can the risks of cyber. And it's harder to conceptualize something that is more difficult to see the potential impacts. Next slide, please. 
So how do we go about building a better response and better planning and preparedness for hazards like cybersecurity? Our approach has been to go back to basics. We are an all hazards emergency management program. Part of that all hazards is cyber. So just like we are incorporating climate change in all of our planning, preparedness, and mitigation, we are incorporating cyber preparedness and cybersecurity in all of our planning, training, exercising, preparedness and mitigation goals and strategic objectives. It's also really critical to build those partnerships and relationships prior to an incident occurring. We are working really hard to make sure that our cybersecurity team and our IT specialists fully understand the role and responsibility of emergency management and that they're already comfortable and familiar with how we operate. We are including them in our planning, training, and exercise program for everything from our natural hazard response to response to terrorism, as well as cybersecurity, so that they truly understand what our capabilities are, how we function, and how they can plug in as a part of the emergency response team during a cyber incident, as well as other incidents as well. Lastly, uh, CISA has really great resources. The Shields Up program and the free information resources and training that are offered are wonderful assets that not enough people take advantage of. We've worked very closely with our local regional advisor who has offered us support and training and has been truly invaluable in trying to help us at the local level build our capacity and build our preparedness uh, in a really specific technical capacity that we don't necessarily have the internal expertise in. And they have been wonderful partners and a tremendous support to us. Next slide, please. Lastly, I wanted to end on a slightly more upbeat note. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Eurovision Song Contest, but it was completed this last weekend, and it is a massively popular European singing competition that attracts tens of millions of viewers. It is a massive event in Europe, and this year it, there was a lot of um, news around that because Russia was removed as a contestant after their invasion of Ukraine. And this last weekend, the Italian police prevented a large hacker attack by the pro-Russian groups Kilnet and Legion, who attempted an attack to thwart the voting following the final performance in Eurovision. Uh, the Ukraine group that I have a picture of here won, and the, hacker, the pro-Russian hacker groups attempted to prevent their win. So cyber attacks are something that are happening in every realm and quite constantly right now. So, however, I did want to say that the European police cyber security uh, did a really great job on this and they prevented the infiltration. So um, Ukraine went on to win the 2022 Eurovision Song Contest. That is all I have. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Clara, for just doing um, such a great job of giving an overview of cybersecurity at all levels. I mean, kind of ending with the international lens, but how um, state and local governments are threatened by cybersecurity attacks. And I'm so glad you touched on the training aspect as well as CISA. Uh, that's very connected to what the rest of our panelists are going to be discussing today. Um, I encourage you to ask questions to Clara in the chat. Um, and then I invite Rebecca to start sharing your screen um, as you will be speaking next. And so Rebecca is the Director of Training Support for the Texas A&M Engineering Extension Services, or TEKS, National Emergency Response and Recovery Training Center. Um, and she's also a Texas A&M University System Regents Fellow. 
She serves as the chair of the National Domestic Preparedness Consortium, NDPC, Committee on Curriculum and Evaluation, representing TEKS in the NDPC's mission of preparing the nation through training, and is the lead operational representative for TEKS with the National Cybersecurity Preparedness Consortium. She's a graduate of Texas A&M, holds a Master's of Business Administration from the University of Phoenix, and is currently pursuing a doctorate degree in Organization and Management from Capella University. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Lily. I appreciate it. I'm very happy to be here, um, especially with the other presenters that are on today. I think it's a, it's a mix of folks that are on the ground with, with the need, but leaning forward and the resources that are being brought to them to help in any way we can. Uh, thank you for, for the introduction and for having me here. It's great to partner with um, the NDPTC. Uh, partnered with the, the team there for many years, and I greatly appreciate everything you're doing. Um, in terms of cybersecurity training, one of the things I wanted to emphasize here with the resources that are funded through the same force, the same uh, source as the NDPTC FEMA training are a set of partners that develop and deliver training specific to cybersecurity. So I'm not only going to speak about what TEKS does in cybersecurity, I'm also going to share what the other cyber consortium members are doing. And we've been doing this together uh, since about 2012. We brought together a team that represents universities uh, from different states. We have the University of Texas at San Antonio, also in Texas, uh, but they've leaned forward in, in areas in the community uh, for cybersecurity infrastructure assurance and security. Also at the University of Memphis, where there's a Center for Information Assurance, um, they work a lot in the academic arena and they've brought a lot to the table and have expanded our online offerings for training. The University of Arkansas system where they have a criminal justice institute gets into the technical aspects for critical infrastructure folks. And then Norwich University uh, with their heavy experience in cyber exercises and working with financial institutions and that type of thing. Together, uh, beginning at, in that 2012 time period, we brought our expertise as both academic field and training providers and began to build this set of courses that reaches across the needs that have uh, come up across all of the states with state, local, tribal, territorial communities that we're really beginning to recognize that cyber was going to be a part of, of what they had to think about going forward. So where, where Clara is at this point uh, is highly advanced in what we've seen some of in the last decade. So I'm, I'm very excited to hear the level of progress that's made out there. And I think that um, you know what we're working on is from a base level and moving forward. Uh, so I just wanted to go over that. We've, we've trained over 100,000 at this point. We have over 30 certified courses across us. And, and this is training that goes out across the country. One of the questions we get off, asked a lot is, how do we decide? What's the map for what we develop? Because our expertise is training. And so we, we've gone back to a model that UTSA created some time ago that was a way to look at a community to just have a framework for how are they doing. And it's a base level model that just speaks to the blocks that come together from awareness to information sharing, policy planning, and, and all the pieces that'll need to be put together that Clara was talking about there. You know, they're incorporating cyber into everything. But then what level are you? Is it, it are you strictly an individual or is it up to organization, community? Uh, you know, that progressive set of everyone is dependent on everyone else. And then how well are you doing from that entry level to the advanced part? And I bring this up just to say that uh, we don't just develop a new course based on, you know, what the, what the chatter is or what's in the news. We take an approach that looks at progress and building uh, both from different skill sets, but also from the perspective of where are they trying to go. Uh, we 
We know that moving from one level to the next level is not just a training gap. It's also about the measurements of how you're doing, the technology you have access to, uh, processes, procedures, assessments, resources. So training is the piece that, that we can look at that will help build those blocks. So I wanted to just frame that in a way that gives you background on how we go about that. We also work closely with FEMA, looking at the results that come out of those annual reports um, when they do their threat hazard identification risk assessment and the stakeholder, stakeholder preparedness reviews. That data, specifically in the core capability of cybersecurity, comes up to the national level and we get a better feel for what are the concerns, what are the vulnerabilities, what are the states and, and communities feel like they're, they're challenged in. So there's that information that comes in that helps us consider what's next. Um, and then we work with the SLTT community, uh, not just in training, but in the other things that we do, exercises, um, helping build plans, assess policies, that type of thing. We, we gather that information and bring it together. Uh, we continue to have conversations with the communities that we train, with our points of contact out there, taking their best practices and their lessons learned, bringing it into the training courses that are then going to be shared across the country with others that um, might not have come to the same level that a community is. And so we're, we're bringing that together to really advance the, each of the communities in a way that is, is a national approach, not just um, one, one city or one community at a time, by sharing those resources as best we can for everyone we can reach. But I love that uh, Clara mentioned CISA has resources as well, because this is part of what, what we consider. They, we look at the initiatives, we look at what they're doing with the SLTT community. We reach out to them, coordinate with them on where our training is aligning with, with what's needed out there and you know having our training linked to their sites. But, making sure that in our training, we are telling people about the resources that are available to them. Because in some ways, that's part of what training does is brings to you the information about what's possible and what you have access to. So we have several different formats for training out of this uh, FEMA funded source, uh, mobile delivery. A lot of our training is mobile. That means we come out to the community whether or not it's a course that's three days long and has a very technical hands-on expertise with a full uh, virtual cyber range that comes with it, or it's a four-hour uh, senior officials risk awareness course that can be done either in person or virtually. Um, we have a wide range of courses there, but we also have a lot of web-based training that is great for individuals to take on their own time. Um, and that ranges from you know, whether or not a person is just an individual that works in an office that has access to a computer to eliminate that vulnerability, or if it's someone who is a technical hands-on person at a critical infrastructure um, partner that, that needs to know more, needs to have those actual uh, defend or, or protect skills. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview, a few of our courses, but there's also uh, two sets of things. We have a, over 30 certified available courses right now. We also have a set of things that are coming, the proposed training. So I'm going to give you a, a snapshot of that really quickly. So we arranged our training in an, in an outline based on where the needs are, where the skill levels are. We have infrastructure training that is more technical, as I mentioned, then we have um, a whole series that is on threat information sharing and making sure that that gap that was clearly identified as a, as a weakness that needed to be strengthened or a capability that wasn't as strong yet, uh, we have a series of course that takes you from an awareness level into a level where you're practicing and you're developing plans and resources. We have an incident response group of courses that is not just how do you respond as a technical person, but if you're in an EOC, where does cyber fit in that EOC? 
Do you bring them in as an expert when that's the threat that you're experiencing then? Or do you incorporate them into your EOC structure for all things going forward? Uh, training that runs through scenarios that tests different possibilities so communities can make those decisions and, and try out different options. Um, we have courses on coordination, planning, and recovery, really diving into not just what are you, what are you going to do, who are you going to call and talk to, how do you write your plans together, but then what are you going to do afterwards? What do you, what do you need to build into your plans now to be prepared to recover more quickly afterwards? And then awareness training that is applicable to everyone. Um, I encourage everyone from high school students to, to elderly people that might be shopping online to take basic level training that helps reduce that human vulnerability. So very, very quickly, I know we are, this is not a long, lengthy session, but just to give you a, an example, under infrastructure, we have a basic course on vulnerability assessment skills. It is, it's a lengthy course, it's 12 hours, but it gives you the basics in an informational style. That's pushing information out to you. But then if you are attending a course where you want some hands-on, you can go into a comprehensive cyber defense course. That's a, a 32 hour course that is hands-on with a virtual network. So we, we have that range of whether it's introductory or hands-on. And then there's also a first responder course, a cyber first responder. I think that's a term that, that really doesn't get highlighted enough is that those people are on the front lines as well. Um, and then we have some courses that are non-technical, but they're trying to broaden the awareness of what, what resiliency in an industrial control system is and, and what that should mean to a community and really bringing groups together that wouldn't have had access to those kind of things or needed any kind of understanding, bringing them into an environment where they can work together and learn more. So that's an example of some of the courses in that area. I mentioned the threat information sharing. This is um, introduction to an ISAL, information sharing and analysis organization, and what it is and what it means to you, what it can do for you. And then going further, establishing an ISAL. How do you do that? What, what's that going to look like in your community? And then a two-day instructor-led course for mid-level management that is really taking that to an organizational level. And this is again focused on your state, local, tribal, territorial. So these are a series of courses that can help build that knowledge into skills and into their managerial styles and perhaps into their actual plans and policies. So in response, we've got a basic level incident response specific to the, the traditional emergency response folks so that they get an idea of what it means to them because uh, terminology gets mixed here. So we're, we're clarifying what does that mean from a cyber perspective and what would it mean for you as a traditional responder and where do your IT people fit in that? And then getting back into that technical cyber incident response for IT personnel. What would you be doing as part of that response? How do you do that? And then I mentioned the course with integrating cyber personnel into the EOC for a cyber incident. That's a, another three-day course where it is scenario-based and people have the chance to play different roles and test things out. Coordination, planning, recovery, um, developing a cybersecurity program for your community and developing an annex for incident response. These are, are basic informational pieces where people are at a beginning stage, but then well, businesses, something like disaster recovery for information systems, these are courses that a small business owner could take that would really help them in, in setting up a plan for what they would do if they were hit. What's the, what's the safety? What, they, what do they need to do to make sure that they can bounce back and that they've got some resiliency? And then a two-day planning course for community managers that helps them build recovery into their plans so that they are more resilient as well. And that gets into the, the management and analysis level. Lastly is, is the awareness level training. And I, as Clara was talking, she, and she was talking about one of the recent attacks where it was a single person, a single email link that led to um, the, the attacker getting in. 
And that's so important that that awareness level and the base level. And so we have a series of courses that are non-technical that bring people into the discussion and give them that base level awareness. So essentials brings people together from a community perspective, understanding social engineering attacks. That's a huge one because that speaks directly to the individual vulnerability, but then mobile device and security. Everyone has a mobile device. What are the risks with that? And then really beginning to bring people into the understanding of what the internet of things is, what it means to them and why it's such a, a commonly heard term these days. Uh, so those different pieces really advancing uh, from every level, from a technical and managerial and individual and an employee level. So here's a, a quick snapshot of where else we're going right now. Um, like I said, these are examples. This is, you know, pieces of what we've got, but I wanted to give you the whole program overview. Um, but where we had that intro piece online, we're now developing a two-day practical Internet of Things security course where it's the next level, where people are actually working on those and, and understanding the components within it. And then another technical course that we're developing is network traffic analysis, where we're, we're really diving into those technical details. And then lastly, we've got an end, end user security and privacy course that's in development where uh, this is another one that people really need to understand. And, and this is the kind of information that they can't easily get in one place. Uh, so that's another one that's being developed, going through that FEMA development process where, where we have those external third-party reviews and we go through the rigor of that, that certification. So I know that uh, that was a lot of information. One of the best places to find out about this training that's no cost, um, funded by FEMA, is at their, their website, firstrespondertraining.gov. You can see more about the, the cyber consortium members with the courses at that website as well, the nationalcpc.org. Uh, but we always send people back to the catalog at firstrespondertraining.gov. Lily, I, I'm at the end, I've got uh, several contacts, uh, individual contacts, including my own from the different organizations. I'm happy to share that in the chat. Um, any of these people, can talk to you about available training, uh, but we are partners just as the NDPC is, there's a, a cyber partnership here as well. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I'm, I'm personally just blown away at the diversity of courses you have to offer on cybersecurity at Teeks. Um, and given all the comments in the chat, it seems like these courses are already well regarded and well recommended. So I encourage all of our audience members to look into the links that Rebecca is sharing, um, and then we can share them again in the chat. I know that for our students at UH, when we teach them about resilience, we go into core capabilities and cybersecurity is definitely one of the core cap capabilities for FEMA under the, I think it's the protection mission area. So I'm really happy to see such focus um, and, you know, such sophistication in the way that you model your trainings. So thank you for your presentation. Um, I do want to invite Giovanni to start screen sharing. Um, Last but not least, uh, we have Giovanni Williams, who is the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, Cybersecurity Advisor. Um, and the acronym for that is CSA. So before joining CISA, Giovanni served as a special agent um, information system security professional at the Department of Defense, um, Counterintelligence and Security Service. There's a lot of acronyms in his bio. <laughs> He's responsible for building resilience for 16 sectors of critical infrastructure for federal, state, local, tribal, U.S. territory, and private industry for DHS CISA Region 9. Giovanni, all yours. Hey, thanks, Lily. Um, and it's it's kind of uh, interesting that I'm, I get to go after everybody else um, who, ve who very much talked about a lot of the topics that I was going to go over today. Um, but let's dive into it because I definitely want to get to some questions um, from folks. Um, so first and foremost, um, I'm from CISA. Uh, and what we do um, at CISA is our goal is to strengthen the nation's cybersecurity and physical infrastructure um, 
I'm joined uh, here in Hawaii um, by a very awesome team of my partners, uh, Mr. Gin Tamora and Mr. James Cruz, um, who are the protective security advisors. And as identified earlier, I am the cybersecurity advisor. All right, so what CISA does, um, we're, def we're, we're the nation's risk managers. Um, so one of, one of the things that I do on a daily basis is I engage with um, our, our federal partners, our, our state partners, um, our private sector partners, our territorial governments, um, just a lot of people um, to build cyber resiliency uh, within the state of Hawaii and within the governments of the territorial partners that I support. Along with my, my PSA partners, um, we, we offer our expertise um, so that we can help people understand um, as, as uh, excuse me, as Rebecca talked about earlier, um, their maturity levels. Um, so we, 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 we break down and, and go into maturity modeling um, as far as building resilience in their programs. Um, we, we get into training, education, um, organizational structure, um, just a lot of things um, so that they can understand the risk to their environments um, and, and ways that they can go about uh, identifying, mitigating, um, and, and addressing those risks. So within CISA, we have a lot of different departments, a lot of different organizations that build up our agency that help us kind of hone in on just different risk and, and different aspects of uh, resilience building. Um, and, and, and here, I'm, I'm a part of uh, CISA Region 9, um, which covers California, Nevada, Arizona, Hawaii, American Samoa, um, Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. So as uh, Lily uh, identified in my bio, I am responsible for 16 sectors of critical infrastructure. I'm not responsible for it by myself. Um, I work with uh, a, a lot of my partners under different uh, presidential directives, uh, PPD 41 and PPD 21, um, which identifies uh, law enforcement personnel along with uh, sector risk management agencies that help um, with the day-to-day, -day. Um, but DHS is responsible for overseeing uh, resilience um, within the 16 uh, sectors of critical infrastructure. As this slide promotes, um, if you have a question of your sector, um, it identifies who is the sector risk management agency, so who's responsible for working with you on a day-to-day -day basis um, so that you can build resiliency within your critical infrastructure. Um, if DHS is, is not identified, you can still work with DHS as we oversee the entire program. So today's cyber risk landscape, um, there, like, like it was talked about earlier, um, just due to uh, the, the situation we have going on in Ukraine, um, there has been an uptick in cybersecurity activities, um, not in just uh, Hawaii, but across the nation, across the world. Um, so we are, we are definitely seeing that. And, and, and as a CISA representative, one of the things that I do is I, I help uh, with the incident response um, and the mitigation actions um, I also serve as the federal coordinator for all cybersecurity incidents um, within the state of Hawaii. Um, and, and I also consult uh, within my region. So as a cybersecurity advisor and a protective security advisor, here are some of the things that we, we look at. Um, we assess, promote, build, educate, listen, and coordinate. Um, myself and my partners who are here in Hawaii, um, this is what we do as a part of our role within CISA um, to help everyone, your, yourselves included, um, and your organizations uh, build that resilience. Um, here's a sampling of some of our offerings as far as our cybersecurity services. Um, and and the, there are similar services from my protective security uh, advisor uh, colleagues who, who focus more on um, all other hazards uh, except for cybersecurity. Um, so my, my colleagues do bombs, they do gates, they do guards, um, all of that stuff. Um, so here's just a sampling of what we offer. So earlier we were talking about maturity models um, and, and just um, how we look at cybersecurity. Um, and and I, I've, we, we've kind of broken it down into to two separate areas. You have your non-technical and your technical. Um, non-technical can be anything from program management, project management, um, organizational, HR, all that stuff. And then you get into your more technical things where you get into um, your port protocols and services, your architecture, your design, um, how things are talking within your network. Um, so we offer just a gamut of different assessments to assess those different levels um, within, your, within your resilience program or your cybersecurity program um, to help you understand it. So one of our primary resources at CISA is our CISA.gov uh, webpage, which it, it, I, I kind of taken a screenshot. So it's www.cisa.gov. 
Um, and from this web page, you can access all the information that we have at CISA. That's our advisories, our vulnerabilities, our educational platforms, um, which, which my colleagues who presented today are a part of the list. Um, it, it has everything that CISA has to offer. All of our knowledge is encompassed within our www.cisa.gov. Um, right now, we're doing our Seals Up campaign, with the, which is uh, primarily associated with the, the Russia-Ukraine uh, incident that we have going on. Um, and, and there's a lot of outreach and, and communication going on with that. We have a national uh, cyber cybersecurity uh, exercise team that we have that can help you practice um, your plans. So if you ever need that um, to facilitate an exercise for you or your organization, please let us know. Um, that is available on our webpage as well. And also just the different training opportunities that we have. We work with everyone um, throughout the nation um, on, on training. Um, so we have federal training, we have private sector training, we have certifications, you name it, TEKS, um, and, and, and what Clara was talking about earlier, um, all of that, we work with our partners um, through and through to make sure that we, we can deliver on uh, what it is you need to build resiliency within your cybersecurity program. And I know I went through that very fast, but I definitely wanted to give an opportunity to have some questions at the end. Um, but here's our contact information for myself and my partners here in Hawaii. And with that being said, Lily, I will pass it back over to you, ma'am. Thanks so much, Giovanni. I feel like your presentation just brought it back full circle for all of the topics that were discussed today by our panelists. Um, so I do want to move into the Q&A section of our third Thursday with our remaining 10 minutes. Um, and I did see a question earlier uh, from someone in the chat for Rebecca specifically, and this is, how did you develop your capability maturity model? And do you have any references? What do you learn about your CMM that made it different than others? So the model was developed by the University of Texas at San Antonio. So I'm not the expert on the model, but I did put a link in the chat that takes you to their site that gives you a little more background and history on it. Um, so hopefully that gives you more information on the specifics of it, the history of it. Um, I presented it as a framework for how we how we find our spot and what all the gaps are. So hopefully that's helpful. Great, thank you. And Frank, I see that you have your hand up. Yeah, I was the one who asked that question. Thanks, I did take a look at that link. That was helpful, thank you. Um, I did want to say, as someone who works in international standards and and as a, an expert on on a corporate level, so enterprise level, um, we look at ISO uh, twenty seven thousand, which is uh, IT security management, and ISO thirty one thousand, which is risk management, as the two key corporate standards or enterprise wise standards that we look uh, to satisfy, and that's because they do give things. So, like incident response, for example, is is one aspect of certainly of uh, IT security management. You know, my suggestion is that someone take in who's ever doing the course development, take a look into those because in terms of getting audited and certified, that's uh, sort of the, at, at the uh, business level or large corporation level, those are the two standards. It's not inconsistent with what you're doing. I'm just saying you might find some, some harmony in, in what's being done from an auditing perspective versus you know what's being done from a government perspective. Hey, uh, Lily, you mind if I jump in really quick? I just kind of want to uh, cover a topic. So Frank, um, just to just to bring it to your attention, so we do work with all of our all of our partners and our stakeholders based on whatever framework it is that they would like to use. So I work with partners who use ISO twenty seven thousand and one. Um, at an enterprise level, um, some enterprises are, at, are may not reach the maturity level yet to to uh, work through something like ISO 27001. Um, so we we will help them try to understand where they are from a maturity perspective and recommend um, a framework um, that could that could help them uh, mature um, in a timely manner so that they can build that resiliency. Thank you. That's great. And I'm so glad you adopted the maturity model because uh, that's been studied since the 1980s. And I wrote in the chat there, you know, there have been enterprises as in the defense industry, but you know, we hired the best people. Why did we fail? It has to do actually with the, the level of maturity of the organization, not the individuals or individual managers. Thank you. 
Excellent discussion. Um, Mary, I see that you have your hand up and then Pradeep, I'd like you to ask your question next. Uh, yes, I, I have a couple of concerns with cyber and that is the um, antivirus that we're actually putting different programs that we can put in our computer. Quite frankly, I don't trust any of them. And I have a, had a tough time deciding who I was going to use. And the other thing is with um, a lot of the computers, they have this bloatware. That it's full of stuff you don't want and it's very difficult to get rid of. What do you suggest? So was that question for me, Mary? I can answer sure, it for yeah, you. Sure, yeah, yeah, that okay. would be great. Yeah, so, so with the first question or, or with the first uh, identified topic, the, the antivirus software. Um, so in order to gain the trust for uh, applications and software systems that you're using in your environment, there are testing mechanisms that you can go about. Um, specifically, um, off the top of my head, you can use something like um, the NIAC process or common criteria. Um, if you're not familiar with that, I can I can help you get familiar with it. Um, but there are testing processes that you can go through to to build that trust um, with the antivirus software. Um, for bloatware, um, usually the types of bloatware that's incorporated with computer systems, um, you have an option as a as a I guess as a customer, um, as a purchaser, uh, uh, someone who uh, acquires uh, that those products. You can talk with those vendors to actually so that they can configure those devices for you if you do not want that. Um, so that's a discussion, depending on how you are acquiring your products. Um, normally when, when you have a contractual agreement with, with, a, with a vendor who supplies those products, they allow you to customize them. Um, so you can work with them to customize those products. So is it possible to get a clean copy? Yes, ma'am, it is. Um, I've worked with we you know vendors like Microsoft. Um, I actually worked for Hewlett Packard before um, and we were able to customize our, our systems based on what the customer wanted. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, Giovanni. Uh, Pradeep, I saw your question in the chat about blockchain. I wonder if you wouldn't mind asking that out loud. I think it's an interesting topic. Uh, thanks, Lily, and great, great presentation. All three presentation, very informative. Uh, my question is uh, basically, you know, the, the current model is, you know, on, on cybersecurity is to make it much more hard, harder than you know, making it inaccessible to the hackers having redundant, redundancy in the system. But what about having you know a paradigm shift and just thinking about using a, a blockchain-enabled framework where you know you there is immutable process, open ledger, distributed, uh, and no hacking can be done essentially. And that's how the you know the Bitcoin system works, but not not. Uh, for the virtual coins, but for all the transaction using smart contracts. Um, and I, I'm asking this because, you know, there has been a lot of work going on in, internationally on transportation logistic where they are using a blockchain enabled platform to uh, monitor, to have contracts, to, you know, match the shippers and the, and, and the suppliers and all those, you know, sort of things. So why not thinking about having infrastructure system and processes on a blockchain. So I know it is a paradigm shift, but probably that may be a, a better way rather than trying to figure out who is smarter, whether the hacker or the security professionals, you know, it may be a better alternate to our current, you know, approach on cybersecurity. Thank you. Do any of our speakers wanna to try to tackle that question? I can. I, I I just don't want to be taking all the thunder here. <laughs> Take it, um, So, sir, from from your perspective, um, utilizing uh, blockchain capabilities, and and please don't get us wrong. At, at the federal government level, we're not telling anyone what to do. Um, but what we are suggesting is that that people um, have uh, repeatable, reportable, and, and standards in their environment so that they are prepared uh, to deal with the types of cyber attacks that we are we are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what you use in your environment is totally up to you, and we are willing to work with you and your organization on whatever technology, whatever standards, um, whatever frameworks that you deem necessary. Um, now, in particular, with the, with the blockchain standard, um, it's still new. Um, folks are still you know, working to understand those standards and how they work in great details and how incorporating them into your environment, um, with, what, what is it going to affect and how is it going to affect it, you know, depending on, you know, each, each cyber or each network is, is completely different. 
Um, so there's no there's no one size fit all kind of uh, recommendation. Um, so I hope that answers your question. We we are definitely willing to work with you um, with what you have. Thanks, Giovanni. Um, I think we have time for only one more question, and I see Alan's hand raised from the County of Hawaii. So over to you, Alan. Great. Well, thank you so much, and I really appreciate. Um, uh, everybody's presentation today. I kind of operate between the planning world and the emergency management world. Um, in just uh, last month, we came back from the APA National Planning Conference, and there was a really amazing presentation um, by, I believe it's Sandra Pinnell, who is at um, U.S. Um, Department of Homeland Security, also in CISA, and they presented on the Infrastructure Resilience Planning Framework, which just came out at the end of last year. Um, and I was just curious, especially as we're seeing this shift towards a lot of mitigation, there's a lot more overlap with the kind of long range planning world and how we can ingrain resiliency into infrastructure planning. And I'm just curious what the status sort of of adoption of using that resilience planning framework um, from sort of the assembled um, experts here and how that can be woven into some of these long range practices, especially as um, there's such a huge emphasis on um, community outreach and engagement overall. All right, I guess that's me again. <laughs> so um, the, the, the cyber resilience model that we, we kind of put out, um, we, we definitely are working with our partners to, to establish that. Um, I, in particular, I was actually just in Kauai uh, the other day um, talking with uh, your law enforcement folks um, and, 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 and some of your emergency management folks on how the city and counties and the state um, in, in large for, for totality of the government, the state government here in Hawaii, you know, how we can work together along with our federal partners um, and our private sector partners to start incorporating some of the, some of the, the there's a lot of, there's legislation coming out, um, there's new monies coming out. How, how can we strategically uh, plan and, and utilize, you know, those resources, you know, over the next five, 10 years so that, you know, Hawaii as a whole can be in a, in a definitely a better place. Um, so we, we, we are definitely working with um, emergency management personnel. Um, I work with the, uh, Haima here in Hawaii, um, Kaima in, in Kauai, along with the big, uh, excuse me, the, the folks in Maui um, and the folks on the, on the big island. Um, and we, a lot of those conversations have just started over the last uh, two years, um, but they are maturing at a rapid pace. Um, there's been a lot of turnover and there's going to be a lot more um, it's, it's an election year, so we, we are definitely posturing to see, you know, if, if the momentum will continue. Great. Well, I, I really appreciate that because ultimately there's so many funds and the redistribution of sort of positions and focus associated with these funds coming out is certainly a reshuffling we're seeing. So I really appreciate all the work you folks are doing on this item. Thanks, both of you. Giovanni, I think you're officially the MVP of the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you for such a lively discussion. Um, we are at the end of the hour, so I want to make sure to respect everyone's time. Um, so. First of all, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today and for engaging in such an interesting conversation about a topic that we normally wouldn't really put this much focus on, but because of all of you and our connection to you, we're able to bring it to light. Um, thank you for all of you who have taken time out of your day to attend our third Thursday. Um, we have another one coming up next month on June 16th, and we're going to be focusing on transportation. So keep an eye out in your inbox and on calendars for the will be circulating. And with that, I want to give our final word to Professor Kim. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, joining us. Uh, I see that Pat Bai is on the call as well, too. And Pat and uh, Dave Fletcher did a really important NCHRP report on cyber and uh, the transportation uh, sector. That is, you know, we have a university transportation center and so we are particularly interested in that form of critical infrastructure. So uh, we will be uh, continuing to do more work and investigation of this uh, complex, uh, important uh, and evolving topic. But once again, thank you, Clara, Rebecca and Giovanni for really excellent informative uh, presentations. So I hope to see you in person soon. Thank you.
Thank you. Aloha, everyone.